Warning! This 16th installment of Spyric and Review Podcast's Bond Marathon will contain adult language, mature situations, a new, more gritty James Bond, a new plot involving Smirch Sponum, mountain sledding with a cello case, a trip to Tangiers, and a killer Walkman. Listener discretion is advised. Spark in Motion Picture Review, James Bond 007, The Living Daylights. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Spark in Motion Picture Review. I'm your host Zan, saying konnichiwa, aloha, bonjour, and what's up? Hey, it's Greta. And we're back again for another fun filled episode of our special, amazing, and wonderful Bond Marathon, also known as the Bondothon, where we talk about all things James Bond up and coming until we hit No Time to Die, the latest James Bond film, the 25th James Bond film. And no, we actually should be at episode 15, but since we did the filler film of Never Say Never Again, we're at 16. So, yeah. It's not a filler film. It's a real... It's an alternate... James Bond is in a movie. No, it's an alternate film made by a different company as opposed to this one. Which, as we said, was the 15th installment in the Eon Productions James Bond series. However, we hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're doing good. We've been... Getting there, we're almost We've halfway through. We've been watching through. a lot of movies. Watching a lot of James Bond movies, and we're almost done with this. And with everything going on, and with people actually able to go outside, it's kind of cool. Makes us want to be able to maybe book trips to these places that we see in these James Bond films. And this one especially, with all the things that had happened. Because a lot did happen. I don't want to go to Russia. Not Russia. We're talking about Tangiers and... Um... Afghanistan. Not Afghanistan. Never Afghanistan. <laughs> But, but all they're not visiting safe places in this movie no not at all but this is also the height of the cold war or near the end of the cold war as we should say because the cold wars in one year the berlin wall falls so when this film took place but if you want to check out any of our other bond marathon episodes you can check them out at w- www.spirekin.com we're also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, and various other social media sites. Just type in S-P-I-R-A-K-N, and I guarantee you'll find us one way or another. So now that that is out of the way, let's actually get to it, shall we? Because in this episode, we got a little bit of stuff to talk about, because it's kind of an iconic moment, because this is officially now we are at Bond number four. Are, All I have to say about that is dum 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 But we are no longer in the era of Moore. Moore is done. He has left and he has been replaced. He is no more, Mr. Moore. Well, he's, unfortunately he is no more because he recently passed. But let's get to the nitty gritty about this film. So this, like you said, is the 15th installment in the Eon Productions James Bond series. It was produced by John Glenn. This is actually, I think, his last film he produced for them. Or there should be one more. It might be Living Daylights is his last one. I think Living Daylights is his last one. But So for all of the 1980s, it's all the same director. So this is the third James Bond film he worked on. And this is produced by Albert Broccoli again. But he's assisted this time by his stepson, Michael G. Wilson, and his daughter, Barbara Broccoli, who will eventually take over and become the head of the Broccoli Corporation. Barbara Broccoli. Broccoli Corp. Well, he, Albert is known as Cubby Broccoli, so... Anyway. Cubby Broccoli? That's his nickname. Well, this is based on several short stories, but the main title is from Ian Fleming's uh, short story, The Living Daylights, which is the first act of the film. And this is also the last film to use an Ian Fleming story title until 2006 with Casino Royale. Originally came out June 29th, 1987. It's got a runtime of 131 minutes, and it feels double that length. This movie starts off really strong, and then it drags. I don't know if it drags. It just keeps it drags going once on. it drags once he gets into once after the Tangier incident happens. Then it drags. Yeah, and that's kind of a shame. It's like the the never ending song. It just goes on and on. No, no, it's not that song. We will not bring that up. <laughs> uh, this was made for forty million dollars, and the budget. For the box office, came out to 191.2 million. So it not only doubled its money, it 
It uh, quadrupled its money. Made four times its amount. So I think it was a success. Kind of, right? I would count it as a success. And before we get to it, as we said, this is a film which was... Where is the production notes on? I can't find it. But like we said, this is based on several different uh, James Bond stories. It's got the... um, the cello from the, uh, what was it? The Lady Rose, the Stradivarius. Which was one of the stories. It's called The Lady Rose. It's got a couple of other stories involved, but the big one is The Living Daylights, which is just one about James being a little burnt out. And that's kind of how he feels in this film. But let's get with some of the actors. So you have Catherine Rabbit and Dulce Luizier as Liz and Ava. They're two CIA agents who are kind of... CIA bunnies? They're there briefly. But I feel like they're what you would want America, uh, American secret spy girls to be. Like, just like sexy, like, hey. Bond girls. They're Bond girls. They're like a better version of Bambi and Thumper. Yes. A much better version. They act better and they feel like they're actually effective. You have Walter... Go- and they're prettier. Oh, well, yeah. You have Walter Golto returning as General Gogol. And he's got a cameo in this one because he's no longer head of the KGB. Now he's in charge of foreign affairs. Which that's kind of a nice little retirement pension. It's like, okay, we don't want you to kill spies anymore. We're going to just have you in front scene and just relax. But he's probably made a lot of enemies throughout his career. Uh, yeah. So that's probably not the best place for him to be, but... But if he's talking to somebody, he can say, but did I kill you? And this is the, like I said, it's the end of the Cold War. So this is probably the last major Cold War one during the Cold War. So it does deal with the kind of now things are a little more peaceful, even though the opening is not peaceful at all. Uh, You have John Terry as Felix Leiter. This is the sixth actor to play him in the Eon franchise. And kind of, I think, not the worst, but he's... American. He's American and he doesn't fit. As Felix, he seems like he should be a different agent. Like, well, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, we have Caroline, like Bl- a John or an Alex or a yes. Uh, but we have Caroline Bliss as Miss Many Pony, replacing Lois Maxwell. So, and she is beautiful. She needs braces, but she is beautiful. She's British, like I said, and she wears glasses, and she seems very. But her glasses are mostly a prop. Yeah, she seems like a very different Miss Many Penny. She doesn't really take him to task because she says, "Hey, you want to come over and pl- we'll listen to my Barry Manilow CDs." You're like, "Whoa!" Or yeah, she's not really keeping him on task, but Many Penny never really does. No, she always just kind of. Lois Maxwell was able to tit for tat. She could keep up with him. Uh, Caroline B- Bliss seems like she's too gaga for him. More like the original. No, the original Lois Maxwell is... That's the one we're talking about. Lois Maxwell, she was tit for tat. She was gaga for him, but she could take whatever he threw at her. Mm. She seemed the smarter of the two. Seemed the smarter of the two. Meanwhile... This one's just like, come on over, James. Come over, James. Please come over, James. You want to hang out, James? Are you okay, James? Let me take your shirt off for you, James. Pretty much. Like, the next one... Um, the next many penny, third many penny. She is someone who's like, I'm gonna try to resist that I'm into you, but she is into him. She's like, they're all into him, but she's trying to be like, yeah, I'm into you, but I'm gonna. It's not gonna affect my work. This one, she'll let James kind of control what she's doing. She's like, oh yeah, work. Oh yeah, you need help, James. You need me to give me a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, James, it's gonna get me fired. Okay, James, type thing. She seems more like a prop. Is that more like a prop, or is this the beginning of women being more forward and it being okay? Mm, That's that's actually a very valid point. Um, Jeffrey Keene is back again as the British Minister of Defense, Frederick Gray. And now he's kind of cool with Bond. When we first met him, he hated Bond, but now he's kind of like, yeah, okay, Bond, (laughs) you're a necessary uh, asset and we like you. You screw around, but we're here for you. Which one was he? He's the guy with the glasses who's in, not M, the other one. Oh, yeah, the yeah, The one who's yeah. been in, like, all the movies. He, like, now knows the purpose of James. Yeah, at first he's like, you're going to fire him. you got to put him on leave. Now he's like, okay, James, just, 
yeah, you're here. We need you to help us out because you know what you're talking about. Um, you have uh, Desmond Llewellyn in this is back again as Q. A little bit smaller role this time, but he's got some cool gadgets and a kind of cool scene. Also, fun fact in the scene that he's in, Princess Di and Prince Charles were at the set and they have a really cool explosion sequence. And that wasn't in the script. The reason why they did it was because Prince Charles accidentally set off the explosive. So he said, oh, we got to film this in somehow. We'll do this. He turned on the radio. Yep. Which would have, which is kind of funny, but it's a cool scene. And Desmond Lawn, he's Q. He is Q. And he pulls off the fact that he knows everything about technology, even though in real life he's like, I can't even program my VCR. Well, could anybody program a VCR? But you know what I mean. Besides you. True. Robert Brown is back again as M. This is, I think, his third film or second as M. And he's okay. He's just. Kind of there, giving orders. He doesn't have the panache of the first M or the next M. The next M has a commanding presence. But she. Admits, but he's okay. But he's okay as M. You have Andreas Wisniewski as Necros, who is the hench of the movie. And I've got to say, as a hench, he does a really good job. He's highly effective. He's a kind of modern Red Grant, I'd say. He's a better Red Grant. Really? Red Grant actually... Well, no, yeah. He's killed more people. and But Red Grant protected Bond. He was acting friendly with him. This guy's just like, I'm going to kill people. But, but his but his like mission was to get like close to him. And screw him over. This guy is... Has accomplished everything he set out to do. Except for... Everything that he was set to do... He did it. Except for killing the general. Because Bond, Bond beat him to it. He was a backup for it, though. That he is said, true. if he doesn't do it, you he, need to. But he did kill everybody. He does it with a pair of headphones. That's his weapon of choice. The cord for the headphones, specifically. While his disc man is... It's not disc man. It's a walk man. It's an old walk man. While his walk man is playing... The end credit music. Yes. Which is kind of nice because it's the end, like when you die, the end, the kill. Yeah, which is kind of funny. Uh, you have Art Malik Hi. as Cameron Shan, who is the leader of the Afghan Mujahid Dean, which they think they do use a certain word there, a uh, resistance group that uh, was funded by the U.S. government. And, well, in the present days, they've used that, that funding to do bad things, but it's like... This is kind of glorifying them a little bit, so this is a little dated. <laughs> different time in history, though. True, different time in history, because these were against the uh, the Soviets. That's the enemy of the enemy. Enemy of my enemy is my ally. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Sorry about this. Uh, just had a little technical difficulty for a we second. We had a little great visitor come to investigate. Yes, especially since we are using a new setup for the podcast. It's a little bit better, more dynamic, I think. Yep. Also, we have our second mic set up. We just have to turn it on eventually <laughs> when we get there. But let's get back to it, shall we? So uh, I think that as Art Malik, I think this is actually his first role. He does a good job. The Yeah, he does. Even though later he's, he's stereotyped as playing a, let's just say... A not nice person who goes... Yeah, but he looks like a bad guy. Well, nowadays you consider him a bad guy, but back then it's like, oh, he's a freedom fighter. But that's the whole thing of freedom fighter versus the other word, which we don't want to say because immediately we'll have people, you know, showing up. But that, that, the difference of that word is dependent on how the war is won. True. Very true. So, next we have John Reese davies Gimli from Lord of the Rings... He's also known as Sala from Indiana Jones. He was Kingpin in Incredible Hulk Trial, the Trial of the Incredible Hulk. He's been in hundreds of movies. He's a great actor. We're talking about Sandrium from Outlander. No, no, oh. we're talking about uh, John Reese Davies. He was Gimli. Oh yes. He was Sala from uh, Indiana Jones. He's a great character actor, and he's great at what he does. And I'm pretty sure he does audiobooks too, which are amazing. He's got that great he's got gravelly that great, voice, like. Bufando it's, voice. Yes, and he's playing... A, you want him to say, Indy! 
No, because that's when he's making an Indian accent, but he's doing a Russian accent. He no, but when he Russian says hi accent. to Indiana Jones, I like how he greets him. Ha, ha, he's he's ha, bombastic. Ha, ha. He's got that ha, 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 ha. That is true. I that like that. True. And he has a very sharp blue suit in this. He looked good in this movie. No, he always looks good. Uh, he's playing General Leonid Pushkin, the new head of the KGB, replacing General Gogol. And like General Gogol, he's more of a man who's resigned to his position. He wants peace, but he's someone you're not going to mess under- with. He understands the necessary evils. He's not like other heads of KGB where it's, we're going to crush our enemies and, you know, and, and have them under our heel. The more corrupt and angry and just let's c- control the world thing. But he's a good, he's a good guy, and he's not bad guy, not good guy. He's indifferent, and originally he was going to be the character who shows up in the next franchise, but they change it to someone else. So after that, you have Jaron Crab as General Georgi Koskov, who is the second in command of the KGB and also a renegade Soviet general. He's the catalyst for this movie. And you could argue he is the big bad, but I don't think he is the big bad. Who is the big bad in this movie? That is a big question, which is kind of an issue of this movie, is that there's two villains, and both of them are not intimidating enough for the big bad, because one says the other one's the big bad, and the other one's kind of like, I'm a big bad, but I'm more like a plot device. Rah! And they throw in a plot at the end, which kind of... The big bad is the... What's his name? The crazy guy with all of the it's not, war well, stuff. The next one we're talking about. Joe Don Baker as yeah, Brad Whitaker. Yeah, he's the bad guy. He's supposed to be the bad guy. He's just an arms dealer who's helping Koskov. Originally, because it it's a power play, but then it turns out, no, it's not about that. It's about opium. So it completely takes a, a left turn at a place we'd never expected. And also, fun fact, Joe Don Baker is the third actor in the Bond franchise to play multiple different characters. The first was Charles Gray, who started this whole thing off as originally playing an informant in You Only Live Twice, and then later on he showed up in Diamonds Are Forever as Blofeld. Walter Gotel, the guy we talk about as General Gogol, he actually played a different character way early on. He was a British agent. So it's kind of crazy him being a British agent and then turning into the head of the KGB for a majority of the series. And then finally we have Joe Don Baker, who starts off in this as this insane arms dealer, Brad Whitaker. And then later on in the Pierce Brosnan era, he is Jack Wade, the CIA agent who kind of takes over for... Who's like a good guy. He looks lighter. Yeah. And they're the only ones that play adversaries and allies, so it's kind of a cool dynamic with that i will say though he's not really imposing he comes across as a rich crybaby no the other guy to me is more the rich crybaby oh well the other guy's just lazy i'm taking a break because i don't have to do anything because i'll just say i'm been kidnapped but he's like but he's the one that oh this caviar is peasant food where i'm from but that is okay this is good he's spoiled this guy's like Oh, I, I'm a general. I did this. Is like, no, you didn't do that. You lied about everything you said. Oh, well, th- that's my. He's com- never fought. He's never fought. That's my competitor saying things. He defected. He's a. Uh... Yeah, Brad Whitaker is not a good. He's not a good villain. He's not. Neither of these villains are very good. Next, you have Miriam Diabu as Kara Milovi, our main Bond girl. Now, fun little fact. She's the cousin of Olivia Diabu's father. And we talked about Olivia Diabu in the Conan the Destroyer episode of the movie review, episode 32. So it's kind of cool that they're related. Actually, it says that Olivia Diabu is the first cousin of hers, twice removed, that her, that her father's cousin is Miriam Diabu. But suffice to say, they're cousins. And I've got to say, as a Bond girl, she's... So skinny. Yeah, but she's a little effective. Yeah. She's not a complete damsel in distress. She does do things. She takes some initiative. She was ready to shoot her, or pretend shoot... Her boyfriend. The guy that she was in love with. Even though she doesn't know how to shoot, which that was kind of funny. 
And then later on, she finds her boyfriend when no one else can find him. Yeah, with like a phone call. A so, phone call. And then later on, she tries to fly an airplane unsuccessfully, but whatever. So finally, let's get to the main guy himself, our main actor in this film, in his film debut as James Bond, Timothy Dalton, who was not the first choice. We talked earlier that Timothy Dalton was supposed to be Bond back when Roger Moore got hired, but that didn't work out. And there were so many people up for this film. There were Australians up. Sean Bean was actually up to be James Bond at one point. Hmm. Who, if you know him in every single movie he's ever been in, he ends up getting killed. And when he becomes a Bond villain, he gets killed. Uh, Mel Gibson was offered the role. He didn't want to do it because he didn't want to be typecast. And the person who vouched for him, who wanted him to be James Bond, was Sean Connery. And Sean Connery even admitted he would come out of retirement to be M. That would have been really cool to have Sean Connery be M. It would have been cool to be M, but Mel Gibson as James Bond, I don't know. No. I mean, yes, his natural old accent. No. He has the British, well, it's an Australian accent, but... No. It could work as that, but it's not that. It's because Mel Gibson's an, a fucking nut job. I don't see him as James Bond. He's not debonair. He's just a loose cannon. And Timothy Dalton does a very different job than... Roger Moore. Roger Moore's James Bond is, we're going to have an adventure and have fun. (laughs) Ha ha! And James Bond, as Sean Connery was, we're doing this, it's a mission, that's my job. But he also had a little bit of style, a little panache. He had style and panache, but at the end, his job was his job. At the end, it was all about revenge, but that's because Lazenby's was, I'm the spy who, I'm going to give everything up to get married, and then sadness happens. Timothy Dalton's James Bond is, I'm a reluctant hero, and more importantly, he's a the veteran agent that just doesn't care anymore. The opening sequence, which is based off of the Living Daylights book, he is straight up like, yeah, if they're going to fire me, they'll fire me. He doesn't care. This job is not what makes him him. True. And originally this film was, was supposed to be an origin story of how he became a double O agent. Really? He was going to be working with another agent as a younger field agent, and then he gets his double O rank. But they said that was that no one wants to know what he was. They want to see what he is at this point, and that's the veteran agent. Which I think is true. I think there's truth to that. It's not really a veteran. He's not that old. He's in his 30s. His late 30s, and he's still charismatic. He's still very good at what he does. And the movie opens up in a training exercise. No, but they, they say veteran agent as in, like... Experienced. Right. He's no longer green. And like I said, this movie opens up in a training exercise and he immediately takes charge in it. And the training exercise also brings back one of the funniest running gags in this series that M's office appears anywhere. This time it's in an airplane. Slash everywhere. Yeah. And his his papers go flying when they open the back door, the jump out door. I'm surprised Minnie Penny was not there with with her... uh, Skirt flying up. No, with the rack. Uh, the hat rack. Oh. And Jay's like, oh, I'll see you soon, Manny Penny. Ah. But it's a training exercise. It's a war game. And someone shows up and starts killing people in the the war game. Agents. They start killing the agents. And they leave a little tag saying, Spot Spursum, which is Death the Spies. Which is the last time we saw that is when Smirsch was around all the way in the beginning of the franchise. Because Death the Smize is the banner of Smirch. So, something's going on. Oh, Smirch. So, James is going to find out what is going on. But first, he has a mission he has to take care of. Which is, there is a defecting general who they need to get out of East Germany. And how are they going to get him out of East Germany? Well, he requested James Bond to get him out. Because James is the best. And the agent who's kind of in charge of this is very like, oh, he heard you're the best. He doesn't know that you're a screw-up. Like, I know you're a screw-up. And it's like, ah, you... Well, it is kind of a slap in the face. Like, you you need to have some kind of ego when you're an agent to be good at your job and have that drive to want to be good at your job. So when you have somebody and you're like, yeah, I'm going to get you out. You're going to defect. I'll I'll help you. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. I don't want you. I want someone else because I heard they're the best. It's like... It's like... It's a a slap in the face. Yeah. 
So I get it. And James is someone who is just charismatic and he's good at what he does. And when he gets there, he notices, one, that there's a beautiful woman cellist who's playing amazingly. But they're saying, no, 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 pay attention to the job. He does the job. He's ready to stop the assassin who's going to shoot the defecting general. And they sees the assassin is the girl, the cellist. So, And she's not really holding the gun right. And she looks nervous. And so he doesn't kill her. And she was playing the cello very well. He ends up shooting her in her arm. Or not Grazing the Grazing her forearm. And destroying the gun. Yes. And say, oh, you missed on purpose. And it's like, no, he didn't miss. It was he just aimed at a different point. But he saves the guy. Then the guy who's all pissed off that James was chosen, his exit strategy is... Putting the guy in the trunk of the car. Which is super dangerous because they'll get him immediately. It's the first place they check. Like, he's never done this before. It's a... He seems like someone who isn't. No, but a he veteran. was he was so proud to to J- when James was saying how are we getting him out? Like what what is your plan? He was so proud to say, "Oh, that's this section, this section, this section. That's need to know. You understand?" Well, yeah, it's policy number 483 subsection. And you don't five. you don't need to know. Like, but you know, don't worry about it. And then when things go to hell, he's like, oh, put him in the trunk. That was my exit. I was like, that's the stupidest exit. I'll take care of it. Meet me here at 2300 hours. And his exit yeah. strategy is pretty... Way better. It's cool. He's going to go through the pipeline that has uh, East Germany giving gas to West Germany. but Or Western Europe. And But the thing is that it's never been tested before. And, and General uh, Koslov... Koskov is freaking out about like what Borscht cake you're gonna kill me he's like no 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 we're fine we we took we we because the girl's like okay well don't do it sooner otherwise he's gonna be <coughs> sausage and he's like ah it's a piece of cake and he's like stop talking about food I'm getting in a metal tube how many times have you done this successfully and they're like you're the first and then the girl uh, the double agent she just straight up starts making out with a guy who you said is from Outlander yes I'm not sure if that he is Sa- he is. Look it up. He plays Sandrium. We'll look at it after. And you know I never know anybody's real names. And he, but he's like, just, she seduces him, and then after everything's done, she smacks him in the face and, what type of girl do you think I am? Isn't he also in, like, Monty Python and stuff? No, he's been in a couple of films. He's been in a lot. But he gets really confused, like, what happened? You were just, you just ripped your shirt off. Well, and she walks in, takes him. her hair done, uh, down, unzips her jumpsuit, and shoves his head into her boobs, and then pushes him off, slaps him, says, I'm not that kind of girl. Like, okay, there's two different messages there. There are two different messages there, and it's a little just, well, he's, like, confused about it, because he's a guy. He's like, what happened? I had my face and boobs, and then you run away? What he didn't seem very upset about it, though. No, nah, he's kind of shocked and amazed. Like, he just doesn't know what to do about it. No, he doesn't. And then he ends up on the other side, and then they use a VTOL, which I'm surprised. that They had a VTOL back in the 80s, but they, that... But jet, that was, like, new technology. Yeah, the jet goes up, and they go away, and then... It does a vertical takeoff. Yep. And I love that when it goes up, you see James looking at the guy like... Yeah. Well, they also hear like something go through the tube of the the gas line, yeah. and so he like looks at James, and then you see the thing take off vertically. And James kind of does a a shit eating grin, mm-hmm. and then when they're driving off, he's, like yeah, I arranged that. As they drive off, the agent is berating him, saying you should have taken the shot, this and that. And this is the point, which is from the book verbatim. He says, "I don't care if they fire me." It's like, but the thing is, I probably gave scared the living daylights out of her. Hence the title. Not as not as corny as the it's a view to a kill. To kill. But this it's it's kinda out there. So they now have this defecting agent who he's defecting because he's claiming that Smirch Smyrna has been or Spinoff is uh sorry. Smirch Spionem is back. And they're killing agents. And he's willing to give it away. And he says the reason why is that the current head, who we said General Pushkin, has lost his mind. He's gone crazy. And if they take care of Pushkin, things will be safe again. He's crazy. He's got a hit list out. This is what he's up to. I can provide more value for you. Just protect me and give me caviar. And Let me be American. Uh, British. British. Let me be British. Sorry. 
So they're kind of agreeing to it. Then suddenly Necro shows up, dressed up as a, a jogger, beats up a milkman, kidnaps the milkman, go breaks in, and then he proceeds to... No, kick- he kills the milkman, hides the body, and then pretends to be the milkman to go into the... the safe house. Safe house. And then he is beats up a bunch of security guards. He had cool weaponry. He had exploding milk bottles. You throw it. That was his only weapon. The rest he was just kind of like, but it was really. He had like the cloth he ripped and put into the, the fireplace, and then it ex- like it was like a timed explosion. Yeah. He had some cool stuff. He did have some cool stuff, but he seemed more... He was effective. The security for the safe house were terrible. Like, we got our D&E agents. These are red shirts, no doubt. But he ends up escaping, kidnapping uh, Koskov, and now they have to terminate Pushkin. And James, since he's friends with Pushkin, he says, fine, let me do it. Because they were going to send him off. He said, I don't know if this is a good idea. We should find Gogol. I want to investigate the deal with the other shooter. And so he gets like I heard, but the, his boss was like, "I I heard you didn't kill the girl." The and he said it was, sniper. He said it was instinct, and they said because your instincts, I don't think we could have you. Maybe do this. I'll get somebody else who can just follow orders. So he agrees to do it. But first, he's going to investigate the girl because he has three days to before he has to kill him. Kill. Uh, yeah, but James Bond has never been a follow orders to no. the T kind of agent. No, he's not. And I'm surprised they didn't send someone else to, to do it while he was doing this. But he ends up going back to uh, to Russia to me finding out about the girl. The girl's a chalice, and she's actually Koskov's girlfriend. Or she thinks she is. She thinks she is. And so she has all the information. So he pretends to be a friend of Koskov. Says, hey, he sent me to take you away. To come get you. And you're going to meet him eventually. So we'll get out of here. I'll get you out of the country. And then after a pretty cool chase sequence, which, again, involves skiers. Yeah, you know, James, like, never really does well skiing. But he's not skiing this time. He is luging. He's sledding. And he's sledding on top of a cello case for a Stradivarius cello. A named cello. Which gets a bullet hole. So it's like, there goes the value of that that $100,000 cello. She plays with it in the end, and it still, like, sounds beautiful but that's like the whole thing about Stradivarius is that they're the best yeah but also we see his newest car and as usual like a lot of the new cars it gets destroyed immediately and fun not before he used every gadget in it yes also cool thing is that this is the return of the Aston Martin to the Bond franchise because they stopped using it after on Her Majesty's Secret Service and they moved over to the Lotus Esprit which has been used for years. But this one has the return of the Aston Martin. And there's two of them. There's the V8 Voltage Convertible. And then in the scenes during the chase, it's a hardtop uh, saloon, uh, V8 saloon that looks like the Volante. And it's kind of cool with all the different gadgets that are on there. He's got uh, laser cutters, missiles. He has uh, spikes for climbing, which he doesn't use. He has um, outriggers. Yeah, which um, he blows out the... I love that scene where he drives out onto the ice fishing lake. He drives into the ice fishing hut, which are meant to be moved around. So you you go put it over your ice fishing hole. Um, I'm sure there's more technical things for all those things. Literally. But he drives into the hut, he slides out, and then, you know, the hut falls away. And people are, sh- it's a chase. People are shooting at him. So he loses the rubber on his wheels and he just has the rims. So he does donuts to cut holes. And then the cars that are chasing him fall into the holes and sink. And then he pulls out the outrigger, which are the sled pieces, lifts the car up. And then he has the jet engine on the back to whew, propel him forward. But the problem is with the jet engine is he can't stop and he runs, rams into a tree. Which sucks, but and he didn't die in it, which I'm surprised. A lot of people die in those those tree accidents. But, but he's James. You're not gonna. You can't kill off James Bond in the middle of a fight scene, even if he is skiing. But he does get out, and then he destroys the car, hitting the self destruct. But the funny part with the self destruct is that you hear a little tick, 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 tick. It's not a boop, boop, boop. It's just ticking. 
And it's kind of crazy to see that. He's not going to do it. Anyway. Sorry. So as we were saying, so from here, they end up going to Austria. And he gets through waving his visa. And they don't stop him because gun She goes, are... here, show them this. And they slide through the gate check and they say, we have nothing to declare. And she yells, except the cello. <laughs> so they end up at this place, which has an amusement park during the day, which that's weird. That was really weird that there's an amusement park during the day. No, that. it was dusk. It becomes night. Yeah, but they have an amusement park at midnight. Like, meet me here at midnight. It's perfectly filled with stuff. I think they said that it's Gerstoff, Vienna. That's cool. And it's a it's a place. It was cool, but it's at this point, uh, Nikros shows up, kills... The guy who was being a jerk earlier on because he has to give Bond some information about what's going on. They also find out that the girl was the... He passes on that uh, Koslov fate defecting because he had the the person shooting him was his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something is up. They're like, she's not a sniper. She's his girlfriend. And they're going to find out more of what's going on. But he gets killed by Necros not using the Walkman. Instead, he uses a jerry-rigged door to smush him. And he dies instantly, which I'm kind of on two fences about. On the one hand, if it cut him in half, I'm totally fine with that. But if it just crushed him, he would have survived long enough to talk. Would he? The thing is, it's super thin. It's this thin. But it could have been... Could have cut him in half. That I would have been fine with, but just... Anyway, that's just me being kind of a gore fan. However, from here, it's they end up having to go to Tangiers, where there's an arms sale where General Pushkin is going to be... Uh, James goes to talk to General Pushkin, actually breaks into his hotel room where he's going to meet his mistress, threatens him by gunpoint, but they kind of agree that something's up and they're going to fake his death. Well, they don't say that. They say, you're going to have to... He's like, I'm going to have to die. So he ends up shooting him, faking his death in a huge way, and we also find out the whole thing... Which was really cool. It was cool, because afterwards you see him on the gurney, he just stands up and he's got a bunch of blood packs on him, a bunch of squibs. I love the little, I've never been so happy that James is a good shot. (laughs) Yeah. And Whitaker is happy about this because he was trying to scam the Soviet government and into something saying, Oh, we've had your money for and we're gonna we have your weapons here and he doesn't want it. So this is where we get kind of the second thing where maybe the whole reason for all this is because they want to fund a new war. And that's kinda of cool. Maybe it's about being funded with a new war. However, we get to the point of it being James uh goes back uh uh, Kara called uh, Whitaker, found out about that James is a spy, but they said that he's a KGB agent, not a real spy. They end up kidnapping him. Knock, she knocks him out. They're on an airplane. And then we find a new twist. It has nothing to do with uh, the weapons. No. What is it about? Diamonds. Well, bad guys have used diamonds as payment, as currency, for a long time. So they're using, I think the diamonds are just currency. They're just currency, but it's like, getting, okay, so he's hiding diamonds. All right. So the whole thing is... But you have to move them so to first, use them as payment. Uh, that is true, but the first plot seemed to be, okay, he's defecting because he's murdering spies. Then it's, he's defecting because he wants to have them assassinate Pushkin to take his position for whatever reason. Fine. He's doing this because he's going to get he's getting diamonds out of the country. Okay. Nothing to do with the weapons now. And then when he gets to Afghanistan and they're sold into but the, the thing. But the thing is that this they... This is when it nosedives. It becomes, no, but they also did say that... That... they All the sides have been watching them. They're waiting to put in a big arms order. Now they're moving the diamonds. So they haven't placed the order yet. They've like kind of placed the order, but they haven't paid for anything yet. So they haven't actually ordered any of the weapons. He's the arms dealer who he acquires them. He's the guy that but he had you them. give your shopping list. So he has all the money. So he turns the money into diamonds 
and he's now moving the diamonds to try to pay for something. So I, I get where they're. I I get the theory of why they're moving the diamonds. No, that what they're part doing makes that. sense, but it just it's now getting convoluted. It's not a I'm going to take over the world. It's not that. It's this has now gone insane. It's okay. We're doing point A to point C to point D to point E to point F to point G. It's getting too. I, I was following him on it. No, I, it's I, far fetched. It's I, super far fetched. I get you. It makes sense. It's perfectly plausible, but it it's realistic. It's not a doomsday device, but it's super like convoluted. It's overblown. Yes. Uh, however, they get they escape the, because they rescued the leader of a uh, free, bunch of Afghan freedom fighters. They get help from them, and then it turns out, oh, he's buying opium. Because he wants to. He wants opium, which if it was, he's buying guns. Okay. It would make sense. But it's now he's buying opium. Maybe he was gonna buy explodium with it. That's what. That's you see. You see where it it stops. It's like that's exactly where it stops. It's like okay, if he's using the diamonds to buy weapons, fine. He had the money to get the weapons. He says he has the the, the weapons. What, why is this extra point happening? Yeah. Because he said he had the weapons and he and he has the money. That's where it stops. It's like, it should stop there. It shouldn't have gone, but it seems like they had four stories and they combined them into one. Yeah. That's my issue with this movie. And it's not a bad movie. It's But this is the part when it slows to a drag. Once they get to Afghanistan, once they get separate, they get arrested. And actually, when they get arrested, they escape in a really cool sequence. And she's like, oh, James, we're free. And he's like, we're in a Soviet prison in the middle of Afghanistan. Soviet air base in the middle of Afghanistan. <laughs> like, like, oh, honey. We're nowhere near safe. We just got out of behind the bars. Like, <laughs> Yeah, we're kind of screwed at this point. Step one of 52... But they get help because they save the guy, and they're now on their way to fight the bad guys. They find out they save the random guy who's also in the prison, who turns out to be the leader of the Chekhov's gun. It's Chekhov's gun. It's this was set to this point for this reason. It's not a. It wasn't calculated, but it works. It's a lot of leaps of logic in this one. So they end up. They're the ones who are buying the items from Whitaker, ironically. And they end up getting the, the items, and then it becomes a chase sequence on an airfield where, first off, you have Koskov disappear. He bails like a smart bad guy does. And then it's Necros trying to kill James Bond while they're hanging out of an airplane off of the drop-off area of the, of the airplane, hanging onto a bag full of drugs. And actually, this it's, cool, it's a cool fight sequence because Necros actually and him fighting in the air is cool. And how he dispatches Necros is cool, but he's been trying to kill... Uh, James Bond the entire time in this fight sequence and as they're hanging there he's holding on to James's boot and James pulls a knife out to cut his boot off to get rid of this guy and the guy starts saying no please no it's like what did you expect you were trying to kill like, him you two were in the fight to the death at what point did you not realize that a fight to the death means death for somebody yeah he goes out like a he, I'm going to say he goes out like a bitch. He does. He's like, no, no, please, no. no. But it's better than the Wilhelm scream. Oh, yeah. If it had the Wilhelm scream, I would have been like, yep, I'll check it out. So which would you rather have? The implausible, no, don't kill me, or the Wilhelm scream? Yeah, good point. So from here, they've got they got rid of all the drugs, and then just to make things even more crazy, the turns out during the fight sequence, a plane has been hit by bullets, so they're running out of... They're running out of fuel, and they're flying in a mountainous area there's nowhere to put down even though where they land is right next to a road that you perfectly could land on but that's always the case in these adventure films but yeah so they end up escaping in another convoluted way involving a parachute and a jeep on a sled so yeah that happens and then they decide to drive they said yeah we have enough gas or, to get to or you're saying it wrong or you're saying it wrong. They escape with a jeep and a parachute from a plane. That is true. That is a good It's all how you say it. It is true. So they escape in this convoluted way, and then when they get out, they're like, yeah, we can... Look, that sign says Karashi. I know a good place where you can go to Let's dinner. Let's go get some food. And it says 239 kilometers. There is no fucking way in the desert you're going to make 239 kilometers with no gas. The jeep could have been perfectly fueled up. 239 kilometers is a little... Well, yeah. If you had a full tank of gas. Maybe. 
It's James Bond. Of course they're going to make it. True, it is James Bond. So, movie ends with a fight sequence at Whitaker's uh, uh, estate, where his estate is essentially an homage to war and himself, because he has a bunch of statues of royal figures, and they're all dressed up. They all look like him. Not royal figures. Figures, awesome war figures throughout history. And yes, some of them are royal, but they're all like they're all Napoleon Bonaparte. They're all generals who were famous for war. And, and they're, they're all, all on mannequins based off of him. The funny part is when you first see this room, it's when Pushkin shows up to demand his money back, saying, we're, we're canceling the deal with you, you're unsavory. It's like saying, you got something's wrong with you, we don't trust you. And when he goes in there, he says, these are all butchers, they're all horrible people. He's like, well... And he brings up the kind of, the winner writes the... Yep. Winner writes the narrative thing, but... James shows up there, they get into a fight sequence, and actually, because Whitaker's an arms dealer, he has all these cool experimental weapons, and also these weird toys, like he has a remote control that has little airplanes attack him, has a little statue that looks like a kid with a cannon, shoot a cannon at him. Yeah, with a working cannon that was just so happened to be fully loaded. Like, this guy is psycho. And he's doing all these crazy fight sequences during this. Also, he's got a kind of technically advanced armored gun, which has 80 bullets in it, which is fine. And actually, it is one of the best lines in the film, and actually my favorite line. Uh, James is using his new... Uh, well, he's using a Beretta, which is eight bullets. He shoots the eight bullets, and then Whitaker's like, you, you've you had your eight. Now take my 80. Right. You've spent your eight. And he ends up shooting him in the way that James beats him is with a statue and one of his, his gadgets. His keychain. Which is a bomb. Well, when you whistle, the wolf whistle, or the British... No, so, dun, 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 it says that, like, nerve yes. gas. But when you do a wolf whistle, the... <whistles> it is a bomb. So he puts it behind the statue, perfectly placed, and then when... It's everything's aligned. He does the wolf whistle and boom, it and it kills down. him instantly. Well, yeah, but that's like a big granite or marble. It crushed him, and I get that. And it hit his head, and then he and then he was crushed underneath the. And there was the glass thing. underneath him, so it was probably like the death that was in uh, Never Say Never Again with all the glass in his back. So I could buy that. Yeah, no, I I buy just the statue hitting his head hard enough. Yeah. To knock him out. Marble would crush... It would smush him no matter what. I, I admit that. Yeah. And then his soldiers come in to stop him, but behind him you have all the KGB agents came because Kozlov was hiding in the attic. And he shows up saying, Oh, General, you're alive. This man was holding me hostage for so long. And Pushkin's like, Okay, send him back to Moscow. Yeah, he embraces him. Overplays it. And he's like, Oh, yeah, first... First flight back to Moscow. Oh, thank you, General. Thank you so much. In a diplomatic pouch. Like, okay, so either they're going to kill him or they're going to like beat him. Like, you can't bullshit a bullshitter. No, and they will torture his They will torture his ass and find out everything he knows. Which also means he might give up the the one girl in uh, in at the tube station. At the gas station, they might give her up. I don't think they're going to believe anything he says. Maybe, but this is the last film, which is Cold War, so maybe it's the end at this point. Right. So they're not going to be as mean, but they're still. he was a traitor. He was a straight-up traitor. He wasn't a, oh, I'm a double agent. No, he, he tried to kill Pushkin. So it ends where now the girl has a reprieve because they said that she was a traitor, but she's now officially allowed to be around the world as an entertainer representing the Soviet Union, as a musician, and she meets General Kosgov, and then at the end of it, James shows up saying he's busy, but he's not busy. He's there, and they make out. The end. In true James Bond fashion. And this film is... And it's well, And it closes with this being the first James Bond film to have two different endings. It, an opening and an ending score. You mean two different music for the ending? Two different two different songs. Because the opening is Aha is the Living Daylights. And the closing is, uh, well, what was it? Where is Everyone Gone? Which is the song that everybody hears. 
And I've got to say, it's very different. It's, it's good music. But it's very different than James, the regular James Bond film. Also, this is the last one that has John Barry doing the theme music. And I love the fact that he used the Living Daylights throughout the movie. Yes. I like that every time the guy goes to kill somebody in the beginning, you hear his... Walkman going off. Yeah. And it's good James Bond music. And... Lots of horns. It's good. It's added something new, because the new thing about this is it's got electric rhythm tracks overdubbed with the orchestra, so it's a nice mix of the two. And this is a relatively new innovation during this time, because it's 1987. What? But of course they're going to put all the new stuff into a cool James Bond movie. Or music for the... Or into the music for the James Bond movie. They put all the newest cars and stuff. So, the good side, the movie is... Well, it's a great introduction to this version of James Bond. He's a great James Bond. The story... He's no Sean Connery, but he is a great James Bond. No, he's a great introduction to... It's a great introduction to a great James Bond who's gritty... He's more dark. He's someone who's a little more charismatic, but he's also wary at the world. And one thing I do like is, like, he can act completely charming and charismatic. Well, also, you made a good point when we were watching it, when the girl, our Bond girl in this one, I already forgot her name, um, when she makes him a drink and drugs him, you're like, see, he really can't trust women. Now, this just adds to it. Yeah, this is making him not trust. Like, all of these interactions add to his P- make, making it easier for him to kill women. Yeah, it's making him more PTSD. Yeah. Because uh, Kara just drugs him at one point. And With his perfectly shaken vodka martini. Because he thinks that he has her completely, and it's not. He's too trusting. That's one thing I didn't like, because he should be more world warrior and more veteran. It, but that's kind of in a lot of them. Even, like, with some of the newer Bonds. He's too trusting. All I have to say is, think Electric King. That wasn't trusting at all. That's if you the old Bond would have just not straight up shot her in the head. He just he's a stone bloody killer. This one's a little bit softer. He's softer. He's a veteran. He's more like I don't care anymore. I'm but he also made friend. the decision like, hey, I only kill professionals. Yes, that is a difference. He only kills professionals and he'll trust non professionals, which is kind of a mistake, but. Well, no, he did the right thing by not killing her because she wasn't a real sniper. That is that is a very valid point. But I like the film. It's well done. I love the music in this movie. I like the scenes. Yeah, great Bond the film. The set pieces are great. Classic Bond film. However, the movie, once it gets to the, the like D plot of, we're going to go to Afghanistan for trading... This for this, and then it's like, no, you're, if you're trading it for weapons, that's one thing, but that's not what they're doing. It's something completely convoluted. When it gets to that point, it the, starts dragging. The movie bit. drags. It goes from what's, it's a two hour movie, it feels like it's a five hour movie from that short period. But the opening sequence, up until. Yeah, even though we were rewatching it, we were to, like, oh, okay. Yeah, right. up until it gets to the point of where she betrays him. It's fast paced, it's quick, it just seems like the last part they drop the ball. However, uh, other things. First off, the hench. Um, we, I have him ranked that he's below uh, Red Grant because Red Grant, while well, did do everything he said to do except killing Bond, but this guy's very good. He's really good. He's better than Emma Bunt because he's a little more loyal than she is. Well, yes, Emma Bunt was still is the one who killed uh, James's wife. He's this guy does his job well, so he's in the top tier. Oh yeah, he was an excellent henchman. He was effective. He did his job. Now, as for villains, this guy—he uh, was good looking too. For as for a henchman, like henchmen aren't really. No, he's he's very good looking in the movie. He looks kind of like yeah. Like there you go, ladies. Here's a. Yep, that's it exactly. Here's a guy you can walk walk around in a speedo. So now, as for our villain, we've kind of debated back and forth, and originally we thought that the villain was General Kozlov. So we're going to stick with him, because Whitaker is really just a plot device. He's in there, he's like, I'm the real, but he's not. He's just kind of like a associate. 
like the guy who set everything in motion who and who survives at the end that I think is the main villain that's Kozlov and he's pretty bad I think he's he's annoying we have him on our list worse than General Kozlov uh, worse than Drax yeah because Drax at least was like yeah he's crazy man who built Station in the Sky but he got a lot done and also he had an epic death Kozlov didn't even get that he was too like oh uh, I love the caviar and you know the Bollingers you bought me food from Herod's. Oh, and... this is great. And then with the kissing and the hugging, it was all too... And then he, you couldn't trust him. He betrayed everybody. And he just... Like him crying when like he, he went... He wasn't and... even a good pretend Russian. He wasn't a, He wasn't even a good general. Like he, he acts like he never had been on an airplane before. He had never done this. He felt like a pretend... Like He should have been like a low-level KGB agent trying to make a play. I think that would have worked better. Like he was I think an that's assistant, essentially what he was. But he's supposed to be the second in command for the KGB, and he did not feel like that. He felt like he was super low level. Hmm. Like he had recently been hired or something else. We, they, because he's really bad in that. And then as for rating for the film, it's a decent film. It's worth watching once, definitely. And right now we have it at. Hold on, it's. Uh, near the bottom it's definitely near the bottom it's not the worst film that still goes to view to kill and moon ranker and diamonds are forever but it's like the fourth from the bottom at this point it's good because all the bond films are great in some in yeah, one way still or another a good bond movie. it's a good bond movie it's just that it's slower it's not the best ever but timothy dalton did do a great job timothy dalton's a great bond he's a great bond it's just the film all the little mechanics. All right. Also, the opening sequence with uh, Living Daylights, kind of cool. It's not as neon as the last one. It's not as iconic 80s, but it's still very 80s. It's very 80s, and you actually see the Bond girls in the background at this. Also, so cool to see the movie open up where you see it's Timothy Dalton in the gun barrel. Yes. It's not uh, just generic. It's actually, you see him... It's not miscellaneous man. Yeah. So it gets points for that. So, yeah. I think that's all we could say about this. We talked about the movie. We talked about the Bond girl. We talked about the music. We talked about the cars. The gadgets were... The oh, keychain. Yeah. Two gadgets. It was the keychain and the car. That's all. Oh, and there was reference to the ghetto blaster which was a ghetto blaster they're making it for the americans yeah. it's called a ghetto blaster but it's, it's a, a boom box with a and what do you call a boom box back in the 80s a ghetto blaster so it's just a boom box which is a rocket launcher that's all it is but it was effective at both and but this is a good revitalizing of james bond i'd say yeah this this set the precedent that this is a different james bond this isn't campy He's not as witty. Sorry, he, he's not as punny. He's not as punny. He's not as he's. Witty. I think he's still just as witty. Yeah, he's and he's witty. He's not. He's as witty. Punny. He's charming. He's not punny. I think he's more charismatic than Roger Moore was. M- way more charismatic. And Roger Moore is charismatic. Don't get me wrong. But... Pierce Brosnan's the most punny. Well, that's just because the writing went to hell after the second movie. I like that, the puns. That those puns went because the first because it. Uh, Pierce, They're just so cheesy. They make you roll your eyes, but, but they James, still make you smile. But James Bond, Goldeneye versus James Bond, Die Another Day are two completely different characters. True. It's like one is he's James Bond. The other one is I'm a pun. Well, no, half of the movie is pun master. Pun master general. But yeah, so. What did you guys think about this movie? Did you like The Living Daylights? Did you hate it? Let us know what you think. Email us at spirekin at gmail.com or me at zan, X-A-N, at spirekin.com. Check out our other websites, our other emails. We have our new show, the Spirekin TV Tuesday, where we talk about new television shows. And I think we're going to just stick with, um, I think we're, for that show, I think we're going to stick with Snowpiercer, definitely. As for the other show... I think we'll touch on it on our next review. I think we're going to wait until, like, a couple episodes and then just, like, binge it. Because it seems like the next couple episodes are going to be, like, a five-parter. Yeah. We'll watch it, but we're not going to review it. I think we'll have to... We'll say something about it on the review. 
video. Definitely, but check it out. Right also, we have our manga review where we're talking about various other things. And our movie review where we actually recently talked about an awesome, amazing movie involving Maximus Decimus. The Gladiator! That's coming out soon, so... I guess that's it for this episode. Um, we're Gonsville. Catch you guys next time. I'm Zan. I'm Greta. The name that means excitement is back. Bond. James Bond.
That girl must be very talented. Shoot up. Believe me, my interest in her is purely professional. What is this? I've had a few optional extras in store. Wherever he goes, adventure follows. Two of our men are dead. Koskov's name to you. Then I must die. Eliminate him. Kill him! for danger. He lives for the moment. He lives on the edge. Whoever she was, I must have scared the living daylights out of her. James Bond, 007, The Living Daylights. something for you. We're just winterizing this. Now, pay attention, 007. Kieran Finder. <whistles> Surprise me. Now, you arm it by pressing that button there. Like that. See? Right. Now, wear that. Right. Now, whistle the first bars of Rue Britannia. Sun gas. Effective range, oh, about five feet. Disorientates any normal person for about, oh, 30 seconds. Don't find too many normal people in this business, Q. What do I do to blow up the room? Whistle, God save the Queen? Well, it so happens, 007, that we've packed the finder with a highly concentrated plastic explosive, sufficient to remove the door of any safe. It's magnetic. The actuating signal is personalized. What's my code? Oh, most appropriate. A wolf whistle. You mean, um... Stop! You may find the keys useful. They open 90% of the world's locks. Just taking the Aston Martin out for a quick spin, Q. Be careful, 007. It's just had a new coat of paint.